Turn, if you will, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. <coughs> Hebrews, chapter 1. We barely got started in chapter 1 last time. We left off discussing the expression, last days. Verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Nearly every commentary will say that the last days began at Calvary, because that's when God spake by his Son. This would make the last days the whole 2,000 years of church history. But notice carefully the rest of verse 2, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. An heir receives an inheritance. Colossians 3.24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But the inheritance Christ receives is not in the church age. Therefore, Hebrews 1, verse 2, can't be aimed at the church age. Christ, uh, the heir, is the same one who, by his own parable, came to the vineyard to receive those things which belonged to him, Matthew 21, but they cast him out and killed him, and they said, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance, Matthew 21, verse 38. And when the Lord finished that narrative, it says, when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them, Matthew 21, verse 34, or 45, rather. Uh, notice the wording of chapter 2 and verse 5. For unto the angels have we not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. The world to come is Christ's millennial inheritance when he rules over the world for a thousand years. Uh, as an interesting note, verse 2, back here in verse 2, says, By whom also he made the world. The Greek word uh, aeon, or eon, is translated as world in the authorized version. The scholars insist that it should be translated as ages, pertaining to time periods, and that uh, translation should always be consistent and uniform in every word it's found. Go back, if you will, to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, notice there, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. All modern versions render that uh, verse as ages, Matthew 28, 20. Yet in Hebrews 1, verse 2, they suddenly translate it as the King James Bible did, worlds. <clears throat> They're not consistent like they insist um, translation is supposed to be. I'm becoming more and more convinced that if God has given the world a perfect book in English, then it behooves every Christian to be able to read English and to read it well, unless you've got the King James Bible translated into Korean, or the King James Bible translated into Spanish, or the King James Bible translated into French, or German, or any other language. You don't have to keep going back to Greek and Hebrew and reinventing the wheel every three or four years. The wheel was perfected in 1611. Now you simply find a way to adapt it to your vehicle, as it may need. But um, if you understand how to read English, if you're an English speaker, that'll do more for your understanding than all the Hebrew and Greek in the world. Matthew 28, verse 20 says, even unto the end of the world. Well, who couldn't discern from that language that it referred to some time frame, some time period? There's no need to correct the Bible. Context and the simple language is sufficient to teach you the Bible. Look, if you will, back at Hebrews 11, 
and verse 3. Hebrews 11, and notice there, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. All the modern Bibles translated as worlds. They didn't translate it as eons, as they insisted it should be. Because here, um, it's, it's plainly referring to stars and planets, things which you can see. And so, given enough time, I think all the modern translations will finally catch up with the authorized version and realize that it's plain, it's correct just as it stands. No need to modify it, no need to adjust it, no need to correct it, no need to improve it, no need to tweak it or change it. It's not my job to change the Bible. It's the Bible's job to change me. And it's a spiritual change that God needs to affect in me by my submission to his Bible. And those who are not in submission to it are going to flounder around and wonder what they're supposed to believe uh, for the rest of their lives. Verse 3, back in our text. Go back there who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Run, keep your finger here and run quickly back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. And... Verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Every serious uh, student should take note of verse 3 in our text. It's been altered by nearly every modern, reliable translation. The Good News Bible, also called today's English version, says, He reflects the brightness of God's glory, and he is the exact likeness of God's own being. That takes away his deity. That takes away the, the in, inherent, uh, intrinsic deity of Jesus Christ. Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, which is, popular right now called The Message. I guess Kenneth Taylor's uh, Living Bible, which was a paraphrase in the 70s, uh, has uh, outlived its, uh, outworn its welcome, and now Mr. Peterson has written a new paraphrase called The Message. But in that he says, this son perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds everything together by what he says, powerful words. The old ASV of 1901 said, effulgence rather than a more simple, plain word of brightness. And the NIV and the new ASV both say, he is the radiance of his glory and not the express image of God, but the representation of his nature. And the new century version says, he is an exact copy of God's nature. Colossians 2 and verse 9 states, In him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And turn, if you will, to John chapter 14. I'm going to be brief today, but John chapter 14 And uh, verses 7, 8, and 9. John 14, verses 7, 8, and 9. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. 
And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? He wasn't merely a reflection. He wasn't merely a mirror uh, or a representation of God. But Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. He was and he is the image of God. If you see Jesus Christ in his resurrected glory, that's all the, the image, that's all the image or the picture of God you need to see. His magnificence will outshine anything you could possibly imagine. And his glory, his splendor will be greater than any king, any ruler, any monarch who has ever lived. And the, the glory, the power, the majesty, and the, the absolute radiance and brilliance and brightness of Jesus Christ will be beyond anything you've ever thought of or seen in your life. You look at the sun, you look at it too long, it'll burn your eyes out. But that'll be nothing compared with the brightness and the brilliance of Jesus Christ. And here's the amazing thing. The Bible says, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. You need a new body uh, and you need these bodies to be changed in order for you to even look upon the brilliance of Jesus Christ. And you're going to be changed like him. Um, we shall see him, uh, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, the hope of a new body, Purify himself, even as he is pure. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. He wasn't merely a representation of God. He was and is the very image of God. And to suggest anything less, or to try to rewrite the verse, or re-describe it, is to do damage to the authority and the deity of Jesus Christ. I wish people would stop playing around with our Bible and simply read it and believe it. God might be able to do something for them. Now, I'm going to conclude with this. Here's a book I found at a thrift store recently. And this has been marked up and highlighted by at least two different people before me. Called The King James Only Controversy by an author named James White. Uh, <laughs> Subtitle, Can You Trust the Modern Translations? James White is a five-point Calvinist, and I assume he believes everything John Calvin taught about God directing every detail in life so that man has no ultimate free will. Actually, he's been a guest in this Calvinistic church just around the corner from us. He's spoken there before. But um, Mr. White endorses multiple modern translations. Let me just read to you a few pages right out of his own book, his own words, in the uh, introduction. The use of a particular English translation of the Bible is surely a personal choice. Many factors can and should go into your decisions as you purchase Bible translations, plural. See that? We strongly encourage Christians to purchase and use multiple translations of the Bible, so that compar comparison can be made between translations. It is best not to be limited to just one translation when studying scripture. Cross-reference between such fine translations as the New King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the New International Version will allow the student of the Bible to get a firm grasp upon the meaning of any particular passage. What if two different translations contradict each other? Who's to decide which one's right? In Mark chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the modern Bibles say, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and then they proceed to quote from um, uh, uh, Zechariah and then Isaiah the prophet. The King James Bible says, as it is written in the prophets, plural, because two prophets are getting ready to be quoted. <clears throat> The King James Bible is right. The modern versions are wrong. They attribute two different prophets' words to one prophet, Isaiah. That's incorrect. So who's to decide which one is right if two versions contradict with each other? Notice he didn't recommend the King James Bible among those 
translations that you might want to trust. And then page 20. Page 20. I count it a great blessing from God to have been allowed to study the Greek and Hebrew languages. But I also recognize that most Christians who are reading this book have not had the same opportunity to learn the languages in which God originally inspired the scriptures. I am also well aware that those of us who know the languages are often guilty of using them in a way that is opposite to our professed reasons for having learned them. Those who have been given the privilege and hence the responsibility of knowing these languages should always strive to make their knowledge useful in the edification of others in the body of Christ. By that false humility just reeks off that page. And in verse 20 of page 26 of his book, the NIV provides numerous examples of dynamic translations for which it has been severely criticized. Probably the most famous of these is the NIV's rendering of the term flesh in Paul's epistles as sinful nature. This is a bit too interpretive for my tastes, even in those places where sinful nature would be understanding, would be the understanding I would give to the term flesh. So James White is the final authority. He's going to decide how the Bible ought to read when comparing one version with another. Don't miss that. Virtually all the so-called experts who major in Greek and Hebrew and minor in soul winning and, and minor in prayer, those guys are going to assume that they, because they went to school and studied dusty languages that nobody speaks anymore, are the final authority. Find me a new a first century Greek, and then first century Greek might be uh, relevant, appropriate to them. But if you can't find any, forget about it. Or as the wise guys would say in Brooklyn, forget about it. <laughs> now, here's a wonderful thing. Dr. Ruckman responded, James White criticized yeah. Dr. Ruckman pretty heavily in his book as the most outstanding representative of the King James Bible movement. Do you know, Jack Hiles and the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, Jack Hiles once had the largest church in America. He was a megachurch before the term megachurch was ever heard of. He had 65,000 members as long back as the 70s. Talk about building big churches and building big works. Jack Hiles was the, was the champion. But uh, he got confused with modern translation of the 1980s, starting to recommend the American Standard Version, or then the New King James Version when it came out. And because of Dr. Ruckman's uh, insistent preaching on it and calling out these so-called fundamentalists that said they believed in a Bible, but then secretly would correct it and change it in the classroom, Jack Hiles got squared away and straightened out on the King James Bible because of Dr. Ruckman's friendship and influence in his understanding. Jack Hiles uh, made a great turn and became uh, only a King James Bible believer uh, for the, to the rest of his life. So, um, but he criticized Dr. Ruckman pretty heavily, Mr. White did. And Dr. Ruckman wrote a re response to James White's book, almost duplicating the same exact cover, same lettering, called The Scholarship Only Controversy. Can you trust the professional liars? <laughs> That's his subtitle. And um, I have to confess, I only bought this last week in our bookstore. I haven't read it yet. Dr. Ruckman was a prolific author. He wrote well over 100 books. And I've read about 35 of them. And uh, use his commentaries in our Bible study. So I'm looking forward to that one because I know how he writes. And, uh, but... When someone, I, I'll tell you the story again and we'll conclude. I was standing in a McDonald's restaurant and I was ordering my food. Yeah, I went to McDonald's. And there was a guy sitting at a table nearby. He was, he had a copy of Nestle's Greek New Testament and the New Schofield Reference Bible opened up on his table there. And I could see what he was doing. He's trying to teach himself Greek and compare the, New Testament, the Greek New Testament with what he was reading in the pages of the Bible. 
The New Schofield Reference Bible is primarily the King James text, but it changed the King James language in over 8,000 places. Because years ago, I went through from Genesis to Revelation, I counted them all. It's about 8,010 places. The New Schofield Reference Bible took out the King James word and replaced it with word or phrase which was found in the old American Standard Version, 1901. So they changed it in about 8,000 places, but in the 31,000 verses, most of it was still the King James text. And therefore, most of it was still based on the same manuscripts that our Bible was based on. But I played dumb, and I walked over to this fellow, and I said, so I see you have some Bible books there. What are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm trying to learn Greek and study the New Testament. And... Um, I said, do you think that's, do you think that'll be helpful? I forget what he said to me. But then I asked, do you think it's possible, have you ever wondered if it's possible that maybe with all these English translations somewhere, there was actually one that was translated correctly from cover to cover, that every verse was the way God wanted it to be, so that, you know, you wouldn't have to doubt it or question it. All you have to do is believe it. And he thought for a second and he said, I don't think there is a book like that. That's what the so-called scholars believe. They don't believe there is any single one book that is perfect from Genesis to Revelation in which every word is there by the providence and the direction of God. It's worded exactly as God wants you to read it. And um, any discrepancies between an Oxford publication or a Cambridge publication are completely irrelevant, insignificant. They don't change the, the uh, uh, essence or the, of the text of the scriptures in any measurable way. It's in, the, the differences are infinitesimal. You can't even measure them. So God has given to us a book that no matter uh, who the publisher is, you should be able to pick it up and trust it from cover to cover. And I'm glad he did. And like I said in church, if you want to spend 50, 60 bucks on the new modern translation, you're welcome to do so. But if you want the Word of God, go down to the Dollar Tree store of the 99-cent-only store, and you'll find a copy of it. And you can guess the price in those stores. 